My name is Tom Grieve. I'm a former state prosecutor and criminal defense attorney, and I also own the largest criminal defense firm in the state of Wisconsin. My firm represents and also talks to numerous people who have been forced to use a firearm in self-defense year in and year out. If you want to know the risks about how a prosecutor may attack you in court for modifying your carry firearm, then be sure to check out our video on that subject, hopefully linked into the description box below. Please also to be sure to show your support for the Second Amendment by clicking like on this video and to of course to subscribe to the channel, not only to help us grow, but also to make sure that you get to see our other content that's coming out. So without further ado, here are my seven rules for modifying your defensive carry firearm. Number one, learn and practice. Yes, this absolutely has everything to do with modifying your firearm, as you'll see. Don't modify your defensive firearm until you learn how to shoot it properly. Doing so will give you a much better idea of what kind of trigger you actually need, not the kind of trigger that you think you want because your buddy did it or you found some sort of online sale. Also, don't improve your trigger as a crutch for your poor skills and sloppy techniques and bad habits. Yes, a better trigger will help you shoot better and more accurately, but you are still handicapped in working with an artificial performance ceiling with the wrong techniques. Learn the proper technique somewhere, whether a top-notch defensive firearms class, ideally, or a local instructor, books, or even some of the better YouTube channels out there. Don't care, just make it happen. Also be sure to practice. Don't modify your defensive firearm until you have an opportunity to practice with it. Practice with a defensive firearm generally happens in one of two ways, at the range and away from the range. After learning the proper techniques on how to shoot so that you don't reinforce bad habits, you are ready for some serious practice time. At the range, be productive and have a plan on what you're trying to accomplish that specific day before you go. Be sure to be disciplined with your round counts and sequences of fire to get the most out of your training budget, both in terms of time and money. Always be sure to practice one-hand and off-handed shooting each time you go, and pay attention to when you shoot your best. Is it right when you first arrive? Is it when you've had a bit of a time to warm up a bit? Or is it perhaps towards the end? Reflect on what that might mean for you and your attention to detail and fatigue levels as your session rolls on. When you are not at the range, you can also dry fire practice. Dry fire practice is free and easy. Be sure to follow all of the safety rules and never fire with a loaded firearm. Even if you just dry fire practice while watching TV for 10, 15 minutes at a time, a few times each week, you will be amazed at how much this helps your pistol shooting at the range and in real life. Be sure to monitor your front sight for the movement so you can judge how smooth your trigger pull is. Remember, just as with anything else, you will get as much out of your dry fire practice as you put into it both measured in time and attention to detail. Number two, beware the short light trigger in real life world stressful scenarios. Keep in mind that a study once identified that both a longer pre-travel and a heavier trigger are each equally effective means of preventing negligent discharges under stress. Some instructors may favor either keeping a longer or a heavier trigger, but for our purposes, just be aware of the general rule and respect it. My bottom line is be short or be light, but don't be both with your defensive firearm. Also, beware of installing light springs in general, because that can lead to light primer strikes resulting in a failure to fire when you may need it the most. Rule number three, understand what makes a good trigger on your particular firearm. Most people think that what makes a good trigger is how light the trigger pull is. While that certainly is part of the story, it is far from being the whole thing. What makes a trigger great is how smooth it is, combined with how tuned are the pre-travel, the over-travel, and the reset distances for that pistol and trigger. When you take these factors, combined with how well you grip the firearm and how well you actually stroke the trigger, in other words, are you actually pulling it straight to the back or slightly to the side, leading to off-center shots, well, this will all determine in its totality how well you were actually able to shoot that firearm. But just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should. Just because that you can make a single action pistol, say a one pound glass trigger with no pre-travel, over-travel, and basically no reset, definitely doesn't mean that you should for a defensive firearm. If you ever do that, just do it for the range, if at all. Keep in mind that a real life 
defensive firearms and use scenario is going to be involving probably dark or low light conditions. You're going to be stressful. You might be squeezing that trigger without even realizing it, let alone bumping into things in the dark. Not time for a one pound glass trigger. It also keeps bearing in mind, and this is important, some basic knowledge about action types of pistols and design features that will offer you different areas where you can improve your firearm within the essential design elements and the overall strengths and weaknesses archetypes of those firearms. A lot of words, keep in mind, I'm an attorney. I will keep this short though, all right? Keep in mind, pistols come in a few different categories. Striker fired, like Glocks, SIG 300 series, like C SIG 365, SIG 320, Smith & Wesson M&Ps. Double action, single action pistols, like HK USPs, HK P30s, uh, SIG P series pistols, many different CZs, Bretas, Breta 92s, PX4 Storm, all that kind of good stuff. And of course, single action only, 1911s, 2011 styles, as well as double action only. Most revolvers being a fantastic representative of that last group. Now, each type of pistol offers a different package of features and trade-offs for their users. No one pistol is universally better and without flaw, though I realize I probably should have given a trigger warning for some of you striker-fired aficionados out there who are probably offended. Look forward to reading those comments. So as an example, double action, single action pistols can, in theory, with proper tuning, offer their users a phenomenal light and short single action pull, of course at the cost of the longer, heavier initial double action pull, which is there to protect against negligent discharges under stress. Double action only pistols, of course, are always long and they're always heavy. And of course, as a corresponding result, they're less likely to have any kind of negligent discharge, whether on shot one or shot five. A single action pistol only can offer a short and light trigger, but it comes at the cost of needing to actuate a safety before firing the pistol. Something that I watch people, of course, struggle and fail at the range time and time again, but somehow they think they're going to be able to do it at 3 a.m. And of course, that's not everyone. That's some people who forget to disengage it at the range. A striker fire pistol is, of course, a bit of a compromise in that it offers a superior trigger to a double action while usually falling short of most single action designs. Striker fired pistols may come with a safety, though, of course, most do not, Glock being a prime example. One big disadvantage of many striker fire pistols without any kind of safety is the fact that you risk a negligent discharge when holstering because when you're reholstering, let's say you're in waistband or appendix or something like that, or even outside waistband, either a corner of the holster or a piece of the shirt could become trapped within the trigger guard, which actually winds up pulling the trigger when you reholster it. A hammer-fired pistol, by contrast, can be protected from this because you can pin the hammer with a firm thumb grip over the back of the hammer to ensure that it does not go off. And of course, if you have any kind of safety and if you're activating that safety, which hopefully you are if you're carrying a single action only pistol like a 1911, then hopefully the safeties are doing just that. It's blocking it from going off even if that shirt bit does get in the way. Now I include all this here because people need to make a conscious informed decision of what kind of trade-offs they are going to accept, what kind of trade-offs they're basically going to be getting themselves into when they choose platform A versus platform B versus platform C. Because again, they all have trade-offs. I also included here because I don't want to see people who have, say, a double action, single action pistol, try to turn their double action, single action into a four pound double, 1.5 pound single with virtually no pre-travel. That's a recipe for disaster. Likewise, turning your striker fired pistol into a 1.5 or two pound with no pre-travel, no safety is also inviting disaster. Work within the design limits and parameters of your chosen tool. If you try to part swap your way into the perfect pistol, you may just have a negligent discharge with a corresponding criminal case and lawsuit waiting to happen. Rule number four, see where you are aiming. Most firearms come with crummy factory sights and that's putting it charitably. Most offensive gun uses happen at night or low light conditions. I would strongly suggest upgrading the sights in your firearm to enable you to actually use and aim them at night and low light conditions. So typically we're talking about something tritium. There's some fantastic brands out there. As a general rule, if you're spending less than $100, I would be a little bit leery. I personally love tritium rather than some sort of fiber optic or some sort of glow in the dark sticker that needs to be recharged with light. But of course, you do you. Don't be afraid to spend a bit here because this can really make a world of difference. Weapon mounted lights, look, 
in real life, I've never seen a weapon mounted light this side of law enforcement wind up getting used. If this is something you want me to go into, let me know in the comments section. It might be a great topic for another video. But for now, you need to be able to see where you're aiming, which I understand can absolutely take flashlights, but you, you have to be able to see your sights. So be sure to upgrade your generally crummy factory sights, which are not night sights. Rule number five. I would strongly suggest that any modifications done to a defensive firearm will be done by a qualified gunsmith or armorer. While it may not escape any of the prosecutor's attacks that I covered in that other video linked below about modifying the trigger or your firearm, it will at least do two things. A, hopefully ensure that any modifications were done properly, and B, give your defense attorney at trial something to push back against the prosecutor with to show that competent professionals were involved and you're not just some Yahoo out there on your own with a credit card and the internet. Yes, I realize that this will add cost. And yes, I realize that some pistols are super easy to work on at home with a couple tools. I get it. Just keep in mind that you are paying for it if you do it yourself through that extra liability and what the jury might think. Rule number six, meticulously test. Be sure to thoroughly and meticulously test your firearm with both range and your preferred carry ammunition following any modification to ensure reliable and accurate functioning. If you want to know more about carry ammunition, we also did a great video about that, so please be sure to check that out in the description box below. Rule number seven, cut the crap. Don't put your skull head stickers, punisher decals, and anything else that the prosecutor can and will use against you in court, no matter how cute you think this is. Yes, you have the First Amendment, but maybe during your criminal defense jury trial or you're facing life in prison isn't the time for you to try to raise your point and wave your flag. Save that for afterwards. If you watched our video linked below, by the way, where we talk about how much mileage the prosecutor is going to be trying to squeeze out of the fact that you have the audacity of carrying a firearm with one of those, their words, not mine, cop killer hollow point ammunition, then you understand the apoplectic meltdown that you're going to be sending the prosecutor into if you have something more like one of these decals on it. And by the way, you're going to be absolutely 100% inviting that onto yourself, and there's a good chance your defense attorney won't have much they can say about it. It will score points against you with the jury. Life in prison is not worth the cute decals. Leave it off. So there are my seven rules for modifying defensive firearms. Now, as a heads up, I actually do, thank you if you stuck around this long, read and respond to the comments in the comment field below, including making videos in response to people's questions. So guys, if you've got questions that you want to see an answer to, be sure to post up those questions in the comment field below. Thanks for sticking around this long. It actually really helps our YouTube metrics. And speaking of YouTube metrics, I would probably be getting kicked if I didn't ask you to please, if you're not already done so already, consider pressing like to show your support, not only for this channel, but also for the Second Amendment, and also to subscribe for more great content coming up. Guys, it's been a pleasure once again. We'll see you in the next one. Guys, if you enjoyed this video, you might like some of the other content that we've been up to recently. Please feel free to check out these other videos. We'll see you in the next one.